Hi there, my name is Gemma, uh, Gemma Bowden. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'll just introduce myself first and then I'll let you know what we're going to be doing today. Um, so I am going to be teaching you the assessment of paediatric patients, which is a subject that I like very much. I teach it in second year and hopefully this will give you the tools that you need to not be afraid of assessment, but to also prepare you for second year. So just a little bit about myself before I uh, crack on. Uh, I know I've seen some of you guys, but most of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet. So I work at the University of Greenwich, obviously, at both Medway and Every Hill campus. I joined at the same time as Lindsay and Richard, slightly before Scott, a couple of months, um, which was April 2016. I did uh, 12 years service at the London Ambulance and I'm happy now to be away from COVID and teaching you guys. I run two second year modules and they are understanding research for evidence-based practice and advanced patient assessment, both of which are 30 credit modules. I don't see very much of first years because I do all the second year skills. So uh, you'll be sick and tired of me by this time next year. All right, let's crack on anyway with paediatric assessment. So really interesting topic, uh, but sometimes paramedics and student paramedics and technicians and EMTs are a little bit scared about attending to paediatric patients. The reason for this is normally, uh, well, number one, they mightn't have much experience of kids. You know, some of you guys might feel the same. You, you might not have tiny sisters and brothers. You might not have kids of your own. You might not have any experience of holding a baby. Um, so some people, understandably, are a little bit wary. The second reason people are wary, and this is experienced paramedics as well, is because paediatric patients can deteriorate quite quickly. So what you will notice and um, what you will be told is that a paediatric patient sustains all their vital signs if they're really unwell. They keep going, keep going, keep going, and then you start to notice the signs of deterioration when it's too late. So they stay well for a long time, even when they are seriously unwell. And it's only when you start to notice massive red flags that you think, hold on a minute, this child is as seriously ill. Let's get them to hospital quick. And within that time, you, you don't have a great opportunity to fix them. So what I want you guys to do is to be really confident when it comes to spotting things that are odd. And the way in which you'll get to do that is by knowing what's normal and what's not normal and what things can go wrong. That's what I want to teach you about today. So, um, First of all, I want to let you know how um, this session is going to run. So I would imagine it's going to take about two hours of your time. It can take longer if you want to investigate further information. Um, that's up to you. But the session itself is around about two hours. The PowerPoint is 20 slides. Um, I'm not going to make you sit there and uh, get them read out to you at once. I am going to break them up into little sections. You've got some video to watch and a little bit of activity as well. So when you notice activity on the screen, what that means is hit pause, go get a cup or whatever, um, do your activity and then unpause again. Because it's not like I'm gonna sit here and wait 10 minutes for you to do the activity, just pause me. All right, here's a rundown of what we're gonna do today. So the aim of the entire session is to introduce you guys uh, to the differences in approach and assessment between adult and paediatric patients. How I'm gonna do that, the first session is gonna be about the anatomical and physiological differences between adults and children. Super, super, super important for you to know so that you can tell when something is not quite right. And I might repeat myself, and you might hear this out on the road, and you might hear it in person from me or anyone else as well, but trust your instincts. If you think this baby, this child is unwell, it probably is. All right, don't take any chances. All right, anyway, back, sorry, getting carried away. Back to the aims and outcomes. So uh, yeah, we're gonna go through the anatomical, 
physiological, and probably some bits about the cognitive differences between children and adult patients. The next session, we're going to talk about the hands-off approach, how you assess paediatric from across the room by merely just looking and listening. And then with that comes the paediatric triangle. The paediatric triangle is a framework which a lot of healthcare professionals around the world use. It's widely recognised for assessing the seriously ill child. It works really well with small children. With older children, you have to adapt it a little bit, but it's a good one for you. So make sure you learn about that. The third session is going to be about vital signs, observations, history taking and particular questions in addition to the history that you already take that we want you to ask with paediatrics. All right, it's all interesting. It's all going to be good. I'm not planning to read from a screen. So let's crack on and start off with an activity. All right, so what I need you to do, like I said, pause the presentation in a second when I tell you to. Um, and what I want you to do is write down the main differences anatomically between paediatric human body and the adult human body. Now, I've given you a little, um, uh, I don't know, a silly picture there, which kind of shows you, you can kind of see what's going on, but I want you to think about how the body changes. If you get a little bit stuck, go back to ABC, or even if you want to, just jot down in ABC. Now I'm going like that because I'm a wee older than you, but you might prefer to write it on your, your notes or whatever like that. It doesn't matter what way you do it. What I want you to do is do the activities because then you'll realize how much you know or how much you don't know and you need to know. All right, so think about the adult human body and what is different with the pediatric body. All right, pause me. I'll see you in five minutes or whenever you're done. All right, hopefully you've got some of these written down. Now I've split this up into airway, breathing and circulation because that's a logical way to do it. When you come to my module in second year, everything is about structure and framework. So if you're a little bit OCD, a little bit like things in a particular order, you will like my module. All right, so airway first of all, let's see how many of these things you've got. When we talk about them and when Every time I teach you, I'm going to always ask you why or so what or what, what does that mean? Justify, tell me what you mean. So anytime you give an answer, I want you to think about the consequences. So first of all, their airway in a paediatric is smaller and shorter, right? So what? What's that going to do? It's got a larger tongue proportion in a smaller oropharynx. So Everything is smaller apart from this big, massive tongue. So what? Well, if a patient's airway is occluded with their tongue, this is going to be a lot more likely to happen with the paediatric patient because of their anatomy. The airway is funnel shaped. So see, uh, let me see if I've got my pointer. Yeah, here we go. The adult is a cylinder like a tube. The child is funnel. So what? What's the big deal about that? Well, this is why you got to cut up the grips. This is why you don't give like a uh, marbles or bouncy balls or uh, things like that to kids, because you imagine something circular, that's going to get stuck in the funnel. When that gets stuck in the funnel, it's going to be really hard to release that. At least with the adult, you expect it's going to go the whole way down and maybe lodge inside the left or right bronchus. Probably, in reality, it's going to be the right bronchus because it's fatter and straighter, whereas the left has to go around the heart. But anyway, with the paediatric patient, imagine a funnel. It's going to plonk itself right down there and block. This is why kids choke. This is why you don't cut a grip horizontally in half. You cut it vertically in half. All right. So. In the younger children, the narrowest part is below the glottis. So as you can see here, right down here, so below the cricoid ring. When you get into second year, or this skill might be now third year, you will learn 
how to put a needle into that cricothyroid membrane in there for last ditch attempt at stopping an airway obstruction. Now this is a really difficult technique and it literally is let's try everything we can to save a life. The patient is not breathing, they are going to die. You cannot um, get rid of the choking from back slaps, abdominal thrusts, chest thrusts, McGill forceps. Nuh -uh. It's gone too far down. You imagine with a little paediatric patient how, sorry, I'm pointing at the screen, uh, there's my cursor, how tiny this little bit is for you to get a needle in the right way to give them a tiny bit of air. Now, you'll discover in when you do this skill that only going to buy you about 15 minutes of time. Smaller the airway, probably it's going to deteriorate quite quick as well. All right, it's more forward as well. So the larynx is more forward, more anterior than the adult patient. When you come to do intubation and advanced airways, this will be a problem because you will not have a really good view. You lie the patient down in front of you when you're doing intubation. You tilt their head, put the laryngoscope in, and you look down the throat and you can see the vocal cords. With the paediatric, you can't see that. It's going to give you a really difficult view. The epiglottis is long, narrow, floppy, and horseshoe shaped. That means it's going to get in the way. Again, more likely to have an airway obstruction, especially because of how their airway sits and how they actually sit. We're going to come on to um, the position in a moment. You'll understand what I mean about position when it comes to the airway. Oh, I said in a minute, it's actually not. Children have a large occiput. What does that mean? If you don't know what it means, pause it, Google it. No shame in that. There'll be a lot of words that you don't know what they mean. It's fine. All right, I'll tell you what the occiput is. Big head. Children have got big, massive, boom, head. So when you lay them down flat, they're automatically, their big head is making their face go like that. They got a tiny little neck. They got a big, massive tongue. They've got a long, leafy, horseshoe epiglottis. That position is going to block in our way. So big head, when you lay them down flat, can block in our way. So you might need to put something under their shoulders so that their head falls back a little bit when you are doing advanced airways. All right, how many of that stuff did you get? I wonder. Anyway, you know it now. So when you come to do the paediatric uh, recess with Scott, you will have to think about the airway. You'll have a look at those tiny, teeny, weeny little OP airways. They go in different way. You'll have to be wary of the big old tongue that you don't push that back. But most of all, when Scott quizzes you, you tell them Gemma told you, big head. You tell them, yes, they have a large occiput. So therefore, when I'm doing the bag valve mask, I'm going to need to put something under the shoulders so that their head aligns better. He'll be so impressed. All right, next, breathing. So the babies, the infants, the smaller children, they're obligatory nasal breathers. What that means, they keep their mouth shut, they breathe through their nose. When you breathe through your nose, do you get the same amount of oxygen in? Well, yeah, you do, but if there's any difficulties, it's going to be a lot worse, a lot quicker. Now, these Babies are quite likely as well. You see small kids, they like little beads, they like little M&Ms, little Skittles. They go right up the nose, don't they? So, sorry, squealing into the microphone. But yeah, they're going into the nose, that's half their airway gone because they're nasal breathers. You get any kind of blockages up there, and that even includes mucus or maybe a bit of blood. That can make their breathing uh, their breathing rate increase and their breathing effort increase, which is more importantly. It's going to be quicker for them to get exhausted because their tiny little lungs, they've got to breathe faster. So when something goes wrong, they're going to breathe faster, 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 faster. Then all of a sudden, boom, too tired, too tired to breathe, can't breathe anymore. And then they tail off and then bad things happen. 
So the respiratory rate essentially is a little bit higher in pediatrics than it is in adults. So later on, I'm going to tell you where to find this information, but you should know roughly when it comes to general OBS with pediatrics, is it higher or lower or the same? So smaller little lungs, shorter airway, they're going to be breathing a bit faster. They've got really high metabolism. You know, you don't see a little fatty baby, do you? They're all a wee bit chubby, but their metabolism is really fast. So people with a higher metabolism have a higher demand for oxygen. So when the oxygen supply is cut off, that's going to really affect them. Now let's think about their breathing. You probably didn't know, but the pediatric ribs are different from the adult ribs. As we know, our ribs are curved like so. When we breathe, the diaphragm flattens and the ribs tend to move downwards and outwards, like so. Now, the child's ribs are just straight like that. So when they breathe, literally, they're just going to go uh, uh, and move up. Uh, uh. Whereas us, uh, uh. right? So when you have rib problems, trauma, things like that, you will notice that the breathing changes. You'll see quite a lot of abdominal breathing. Now, it's not always a red flag. It's not always a warning sign if you see the baby or the child breathing from the abdomen because they're going to use those muscles. The most predominant muscle that they use for breathing is the diaphragm. So it's all right if you see the abdomen moving up and down. It's not all right if you see it moving in. We're going to come to that a little bit later. I've done it again a little bit later. So right now, compliant chest wall. So if they're breathing and you see it sucking in, then you will notice there's big problems here because they're literally, they're trying to pull all of the air in with great, great effort. And therefore you will see a recession. So there's sternal recession or intercostal recession. The sternum, obviously, as you know, is around the breastbone. So you will see literally the kid sucking in trying to get it right into the lungs and you'll see the skin sucking in there and in the intercostal spaces. So that's a really bad sign. Below here is a table of what you can expect for um, general observations for paediatrics. Now, it's good to know roughly what they are, but they might not be exact. So if you have a newborn and the newborn's respirate is 48, you might be going, Oh, well, it says here that that should be 44 per minute. I think this is serious difficulty. Ask mom, ask the carer, the caregiver. What is, do they normally breathe this fast? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or no. And then you know the difference. All right. It doesn't have to be 44 on the dot. The rest of them are all ranges. So for us, for adults, we're normally between 12 and 20. When you're sleeping, like you're about 12. When you're talking, you're about 20. It's not abnormal for people to have 22, but it's out of normal range. Is it normal for them? Always ask that. All right, next up, circulation. Okay, so when you're taking a pediatric pulse, it's in a different location. Obviously with an adult, we tend to, if it's cardiac arrest, we use the carotid artery for the pulse or the femoral artery. If it is just a general wellness check, general assessment we tend to use the radial pulse oops radial pulse here with a pediatric it's not quite as pronounced there and they got the short fat necks so you can't really get it there so what you tend to find is brachial the brachial pulse the artery is just here under your bicep so if you've got any little um kids in your life nieces nephews whatever see if you can practice taking a pulse on the brachial artery when you're out on placement and you have paediatrics, practice it if they will let you. All right. Don't make the kid get into distress because you come along going, ah, hey, can I do pulse? All right. Just try and take it easy. Do it if you can do it. Right. Blood pressure. Hugely debatable topic. My advice to you is to do the blood pressure only when necessary on kids. The, it's really, it's quite an unreliable tool. Um, 
I wouldn't necessarily put them through the pain of it to get um, a possibly inaccurate uh, reading unless I really needed to. The cuff sizes aren't the right size. Their vascular resistance is lower. Um, yeah, it's going to give you inaccurate readings. However, if you've got a patient who you're expecting of dehydration, I would do a blood pressure just to check. And I would try and keep going, try and keep doing repeat blood pressures to double check the things. There are other ways of checking for dehydration, which we will come on to later on. So blood pressure, if you can, but if you can't, and it's not hypovolemic, maybe it's not necessary. I'd ask Scott how he feels about blood pressure as well. My opinion is only do it if you need to do it. All right, so the subcutaneous tissue is greater, it's fatter. So therefore, when you're trying to get IV access, it's going to be mega difficult. So you think about where you normally gain IV access, and that's here in your anticuticle fossa, which is right in the middle of your arm around uh, Sorry, I can't do this camera around that area. Anyway, with the pediatric, because they've got the thick tissue, you can't see the veins. Really, really hard to get venous access on a younger child. Um, when pediatrics do go into cardiac arrest, it's quite rare that you will see somebody with a cardiac condition, cardiac arrest. Um, so therefore, the most common thing that you will see is a respiratory induced cardiac arrest. And that would give you a rhythm of asystole or PEA, pulseless electrical activity. And we all know both of those are non-shockable. So if you see a pediatric and they've got VF or pulseless VT, the shockable rhythms, it's quite likely that they might have an underlying cardiac problem. It's not normal to see VF and pulses VT in a cardiac arrest. So always ask about the history. Now we're going to come on to the history a little bit later on, as in in a different chapter, not next thing I say. So therefore, let's leave that for now, but bear it in mind. And when Scott asks you, hmm, what arrest do pediatrics normally fall into? You can say asystole most of the time. PEA second most of the time because it's respiratory, Scott. Yo. Anyway, when it comes to the circulatory system and blood loss or fluid loss, because we know hypovolemic shock and hypovolemia as a reversible cause in cardiac arrest are not always do with blood. Brackets. They can be diarrhea and vomiting. They can be burns. They can be other fluid loss. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's difficult to assess a low blood volume or a low fluid volume in a child because we're not reliant on the blood pressure. It's also more significant. So I put an example up here. You've got a five kilogram baby and they only spill, like uh, only leak. 100 milliliters of fluid. You're thinking, that's only 100 milliliters. Come on, no big deal. It is a big deal because that's 10% of their entire total blood or fluid volume of their body. So bear in mind that if you can estimate blood loss internally, or externally, or fluid loss, that how significant is that going to be? to the weight of the child. You know, us adults are carrying around is uh, five liters, isn't it, or nine pints? Yeah. Um, so for us to lose 100 milliliters is not too much of a big deal, but a tiny person to lose that, massive big deal. All right, and I've written here in pink, I hope you can see it, hypotension is a lit sign. All right, so if you see hypotension, and the reasons you would see that is checking for dehydration, knowing that it's happened because you can estimate blood loss, assuming a mechanism of injury would give you internal blood loss, that is going to be really bad. Okay, so if you are thinking about 
fluid loss, take it seriously. All right, thank you. So the next part, we're going to talk about the hands-off assessment, but that's going to happen in part two of this session. So thanks for listening so far, and I'll see you when you log on to the next bit. Cheerio!